Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Hello, and you're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar coming to you live from the Chagask studio in Carlow. Today, we're celebrating the 150th episode of the Signpost series. And it's hard to believe that it's almost three years ago since Ireland entered into its first lockdown. In our uh, first episode, we broadcast live from the simple surrounds of my daughter's bedroom. So needless to say, we've all come a long way since then. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our many speakers throughout the series. Our fantastic uh, team, Yvonne Maher, Andy Boland, Pat Murphy, Catherine Keena, and Declan McArdle, and our industry partners, and of course, you, the audience, uh, for your continued support throughout the series. To mark this occasion, I'm delighted to welcome our director, Professor Frank O'Mara, to give us an update on the new climate action strategy recently launched by Chagask. Frank, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mark. And look, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a big milestone, actually, for you and the team, the 150th um, webinar. And uh, it's been a very important series for Chagas to develop, actually, and very successful in terms of knowledge dissemination and communication. And uh, look, full credit to you and the team for, for establishing it. And obviously, you've created something that, that has... Um, resonance with people because you've been able to keep it going for 150 episodes and I've no doubt you're glad to be your daughter is glad that you're out of her bedroom now at this stage and we're in the the surrounds here today of, of the Chaga studio in Carlo. Absolutely yes it is it really it really shows the the journey that we've we've been all on over the last last number of years. Uh, Frank if we could go straight into uh, this morning's discussion um, earlier this week the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change they published an important report uh, where they said that without critical actions in the form of deep, rapid and sustained greenhouse gas reductions, we will shoot past the 1.5 degrees temperature increase and possibly even 2 degrees by mid-century. Are you concerned about the potential consequences for agriculture in Ireland? Yes, so look, the, the report that came out this week was a synthesis report of the, the three component parts of the IPCC's assessment that were published over the last two years. Um, so it pulls together that and really what it's set, setting out is the, the, in stark terms the challenge that we face to um, you know, keep within the, the target of, of 1.5 degrees which is very very challenging and certainly within 2 degrees and look it calls that we need uh, urgent action and I suppose we, we see that translated down here in Ireland with our government's uh, policy to reduce our emissions by 51% by, by 2030 so you know rapid and, and deep cuts and um, and we're all working hard to, to, to achieve those. And look, in terms of the impact of not achieving them or even, you know, the impact of the, the change we're seeing in our climate to date, mm -hmm. um, and that's likely to, to happen as a result of the, the glide path we will have to, to, to net zero by 2050. Um, certainly, look, agriculture is hugely weather dependent. And, uh, you know, we need rain, but we don't need too much of it. Uh, we need sunshine, but we don't need too much of it. So we all know the consequences, we'll say, of periods of drought, um, or periods of, of long and continuous rainfall for our grazing system or, or our crops. And obviously we want to avoid those extremes of, of weather for, for agriculture and also look for, for our whole society and, and economy because of the disruption that they can potentially cause. And of course, it's a global response that's needed to, to, to curb that, that change, isn't it? Absolutely. Look, and, and it, it does require every, every country to do something. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose, you know, every country has to take on that challenge. Uh, we can't wait for every other country. You know, some countries should, should, should take a lead. And I think, look, Ireland and the EU in particular um, see themselves as, as in a position and uh, wish to, to take a lead in terms of, of action in this really, really challenging problem. So the, the Irish government has published its climate action plan which, uh, and the legislation attached to that and it has uh, assigned a target of 25% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. How, how confident are you that we're going to achieve that? Yeah, so look, some people might say that's, that's a low target in comparison, we'll say, to the targets given to the energy sector. And, um, but, you know, agriculture is a sector where the emissions are, are very, very uh, difficult to, to, um, to mitigate. So 25% is actually a very, very challenging target for, for the agriculture sector. And to do that by 2030, it really will, will push the system in terms of how it can respond. But look, it, it can be done. You know, we, we see um, the pathway to doing that being in three stages. One, we need to adopt 
the technologies that we already know about. Um, and that's things like our protected urea or reducing fertilizer levels through introduction of clover or improving age at slaughter. We, we have a lot of technologies in the pipeline that are almost ready to be, you know, deployed at farm level. And, um, you know, so as they as they become available over the next few years, the second phase is really to see those being adopted on, on farms. And that's things like widespread reductions in age, age at slaughter, maybe the introduction of, of feed additives for, for ruminant animals. And, and then we, we still, that, that, that will get us maybe two thirds of the way. And the last third of the journey is going to require, you know, new technologies uh, that are to be developed that are currently just at an early stage. And uh, but I'm, I'm confident, you know, with the, the research pipeline that's there, that we will see uh, additional technologies emerging over the coming years. And of course, we'll have the challenge then of supporting farmers to adopt all those technologies at, at farm level. So, look, it can be done. And I'm determined that uh, Chagas will play its part in terms of the, the research and the advisory support that's needed to farmers and the education of our young farmers that we will step up to the mark in terms of playing our role to ensure that those targets can be achieved. Okay, so we're now, we're now going to talk about the, the Chagas Climate Action Strategy. But before we do that, we're going to hear uh, what farmers are doing to respond to the climate challenge. Climate change is probably the greatest challenge facing the world right now. We all have a role to play in reducing its impact through the choices that we make. The Signpost programme is supporting and enabling farmers to make the right choices. We want to leave this farm in a better condition than we got it in. We are fortunate to live in a beautiful part of this world. Our children and all future generations of our family, the local community and wider society deserve the same opportunity to enjoy this beautiful country. Well, look, it's inevitable that we're going to be introducing regulations to make us, to help us farm in a more sustainable way, which I fully agree with. And I'd rather make those changes now to suit my farming system as opposed to those regulations being imposed on me in the future. sure that the customer wants to buy the product that I produce. The customer is getting more and more aware of the environment and how food is produced and fair. I want to do my share to reduce emissions, which will hopefully help reduce the risk of severe weather events happening, like the ones we had in 2018. We all have a role to play, no matter how small. Implementing the technologies to reduce emissions is a win-win for my farm. Many of the changes that I'm making are also helping to reduce my farm costs.
solution to climate change. Carbon farming, forestry, energy generation and diversification will all offer opportunities to me and others. So, uh, Frank, there's no doubt uh, about the commitment uh, from farmers uh, to, to address this challenge. Uh, can you tell us about this climate uh, action strategy that Chagas yeah. has recently launched and its significance? OK, well, look, two things, I suppose. Um, we have been active in climate research and advising farmers around the technologies to reduce emissions for many years. So it's not like we're starting now. But with the, the government's climate action plan and the, the new carbon budgets that were, were set um, uh, recently, we recognised we needed to up our game in relation to what we were doing across both research, advice and, and education. So that's what our climate strategy was about. And look, we recognise we are not the only people that, that are going to change this. Like farm, Ultimately, it's farmers, like we've just seen, the actions that they take are going to, to make the difference to our emissions. But they, they need support from, from I, as I see it, three sectors. They need support from government, you know, who are responsible for how our whole agricultural system is organised and regulation. So government have a very important role to play. I think industry have an important role to play in terms of incentivising farmers um, in relation to the, the practices maybe that, that by which food is produced. And there's a huge role then for research and innovation. And that's where we have a role to play. And we are stepping up, I suppose, with our strategy now to say we are going to, you know, lead that pillar of, of research and innovation and support farmers as they go on the journey to um, to to meeting our, our, our targets by 2030. OK, so if we can take a look at the individual components of the strategy, the, the signpost, uh, or sorry, the, the climate advisory stra program or signpost advisory program, what's your ambition around that particular yeah. aspect of the strategy? OK, so look, there's, uh, there, there's three parts to it, maybe just as well, Mark, to, to set the background. There's the, the new signpost advisory program. We have a sustainability digital platform and we have a new uh, research centre, a virtual research centre. And, and they're all interconnected in terms of how, how we will respond or how we will support farmers uh, in this challenge. So the signpost advisory program is about working with individual farmers to uh, create a plan for, for their farm. It's building on a program that we already had, the Signpost Farm Program, which is a network of 120 demonstration farms around the country. And you know, it was this series of webinars was established around the time we were establishing that Signpost Program. And you know, when we're coming now to our new Signpost Advisory Program, if we didn't have the demonstration farm part, that would be the first thing we'd be putting in place. So we've got that building block in place. We're building now on top of that. So the new service will be available to all farmers. And as I said, they, a farmer that enters this program, um, we will help him or her to uh, know what their current emissions profile is on their farm and then generate a customized plan or a farm specific plan to how, they, to, how to reduce those emissions. And we'll support them then over three years to, to actually achieve that reduction uh, in emissions and implement the, the, the plan for, for their farm. So, um, we're putting in place a new team of advisors in relation to that, uh, and most of those now are selected and intensive training will start next month and we'll start the, um, the, the workshops with farmers to, to kick off this process in the next month or so. So it's an exciting time for us. Mm -hmm. um, we would hope over the, the next um, five years that we would enroll 50,000 farmers in this in this program. And, um, you know, by that, we, we hope it's going to have a very, very significant impact. And for the farmers who are watching us uh, this morning, uh, what would you say to them? Why should they uh, engage yeah. with this programme? Well, look, I think, as I said earlier, there is buy-in from farmers. You know, they want to address this problem. They realise it's, it's there, you know, they're part of society. They understand the, the importance of, of addressing it and they understand the, the, the target that agriculture has been set. So this is an opportunity now for a farmer to, to I suppose, get, get on, 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 on the, um, the, the track to reduce their emissions. So often farmers say, well, you know, I don't know where I'm starting from. So the first thing we're going to do is tell you where you are now, where you're starting from, and then what would work on your particular farm. So we'll identify four or five things, uh, you know, at the start that will be the plan for that farmer, and we'll help you to implement them. And we can track, help you to track your progress uh, over that period. So look, it's a way to future proof your mm -hmm. farm. This is not going to go away as an issue. Mm -hmm. I think every farmer is going to have to address it in the end of the day. So, you know, why not get in early and, and get on the road mm -hmm. uh, to, to get your farm in the place that it needs to be? 
I, I uh, met with uh, Mary Donnelly uh, before Christmas, the, the chair of the, the Climate Change uh, Council. And um, Mary, we, we were talked about the, the, the continuous monitoring uh, that's happening around the, the targets and how, how close that we are to the targets. Uh, but she did say if we don't hit these targets or even the midterm targets, uh, that there could be consequences or tightening of, of restrictions around uh, agriculture. Is that a concern? Well, look, um, it's the same for all sectors. Uh, we have targets, we have a 2030 headline target of reducing emissions by 25%. But, you know, there's a carbon budget for the period up to 2025. And uh, so that's a big milestone. And um, if we haven't uh, worked, stayed within our carbon budget by 2025, it makes the period after 2025 going to be more challenging. It, the, 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 the deficit will be brought forward for us. So, mm. so the sooner we, we take action, uh, the better. And um, look, it's, it's not for, for me to say what the consequences of not reaching the targets are. That's, that's a, obviously a, a decision for, for government. But um, I much prefer that we're not in, in a position of having to worry about that. Let's try and meet these targets and um, all put our shoulders to, to the wheel. And, and yeah. I think we can. So we really need to hit the ground running on this. Um, yeah. You talked about the demonstration farm network. What about the Chagask farm network? What's happening there yeah. within Chagask's farms? So, so look, we, we obviously have, have a lot of farms ourselves in our, college, our agricultural colleges and our research centres. And we're obviously, you know, it's really important that we are adopting best practice on those farms as well. And, and we are, you know, we've a group of very committed farm managers um, and they understand what needs to be done. So, you know, we are, I think, at the forefront. I was just looking at the, the figures for, for last year. So, um over 80 percent of our of our um nitrogen was applied as protected urea versus a national target of getting to 50 percent so you know we're 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 well well um embedded with that technology uh in terms of slurry all our slurry is applied by low emissions uh slurry methods and um uh, again about 80 percent of it was applied by the the middle of june uh with you know a target we would have set of about 75 percent so again we exceeded that on our farms and, um, you know, there's lots of other measures and, and we, we generally tend to be, be doing all those things. And, and one that I, I'd pick out is we planted uh, over 25 kilometres of hedgerows on Chagas farms in the last three years. So, you know, again, that's a commitment to improving biodiversity mm -hmm. on our farms, as well as the, the potential carbon capture of, the, of those hedgerows. Would you have any concerns, Frank, about the, you know, the level of investment that's needed on farms to, to achieve these goals? I mean, that impact, what impact is that going to have on profitability of farms? Yeah. Um, I mean, we see already a lot of investment in, in storage, uh, in sorry, storage and uh, new uh, low emission spreading machinery. Uh, yeah. You know, is that, is that trajectory going to continue? Look, um, we are very conscious that sustainability is, is not just about environmental sustainability. And from, from a farmer's perspective, the economic sustainability of their business is paramount. And so the technologies that we develop or that we, we encourage farmers to adopt, uh, they're generally cost neutral or very often they'll, they'll result in farmers saving money or, or, or making more profit. So, for instance, replacing chemical nitrogen with biological fixed nitrogen from, from the air through the use of clovers, like that's a win-win. Now, it's a difficult technology to implement. So, you know, farmers need support in relation to the adoption of clover. And that's where our signpost advisory program comes in to give them that support. Likewise, with protected urea, like it's, it is cheaper form of nitrogen than, than a calcium ammonium nitrate. So, so we're very conscious that the technologies need to be ones that, that farmers won't um, reject because they're going to cost them more money or, or result in reducing profitability. In terms of investment on farms, um, Look, the, the, the slurry storage on, on farms, obviously farmers have to comply with the, the minimum amount of storage. It's something I, I think I'd very much like to see, you know, farmers in a position that they can decide when to use their, their manure, their, their slurry, you know, that it's not dependent on the, the slurry store being full. So that if, if they wish to hold it for another few weeks until grass has grown a bit better or whatever, that they're in a, a position to do that. So I think that's a good position for farmers to be in because that's a hugely valuable resource you have in those tanks and you want to be able to use it uh, to best effect and get the, the best monetary value out of it. So investment in slurry storage, I think, is something we, we, we will see more of going on on, on farms as, as a lot of farmers are on a development plan. So that, that would be very much part of their, their planning, I'm sure. 
Okay, we're going to take a look at the other aspects of the, the climate action strategy now, and we're going to hear how farmers are respond. Uh, sorry, how, how the digital sustainability platform is being developed uh, for uh, to support farmers in this change. The objective of the sustainability digital platform is to create an infrastructure to facilitate robust calculations of the environmental impact of a farming system. The calculations are based on significant research by Chagas on life cycle assessment models over the past few years. They have now been adopted across the agriculture sector. The first phase is to develop a decision support tool to support farmers and advisors on recommended management practices that can improve a given farm's performance. This phase is focused on beef and dairy systems. However, the overall objective is to, to cater for a wide range of farming systems in Ireland. The Sustainability Digital Platform is an industry-wide collaboration between Chagas, ICBF and Borbia. Farm data residing in existing databases will be collated to maximise the automation potential of the assessment process, which will improve accuracy of the results uh, to support decisions and ensure transparency. The Sustainability Digital Platform will be piloted on Chagas Signpost Programme demonstration farms before being deployed to all commercial farms. The Sustainability Platform will be used to establish the baseline performance of an individual farm. This decision support tool will be used by advisors and farmers to determine the impact of key recommended practices to reduce emissions and enhance removals which in turn will contribute to a farm specific action plan. The platform will be co-designed with advisors and farmers to ensure firstly that it's user friendly, secondly interactive and thirdly informative. This infrastructure will ensure that each farm will be provided with results based on the same calculations. The sustainability digital platform will ensure that each farmer knows their number and can make a plan to reduce environmental impacts. Maybe to, to just to elaborate on the digital sustainability yeah. platform, could you tell us more about that, Frank? Look, I, this is a really important development for, for Chagask and for Ireland, uh, I think. You know, I suppose the, the background to it was we didn't have any tool that our advisors could use with farmers, you know, to, to set out, well, where are you now and what's the best thing for you to do in your farm and, and what impact would there be on your emissions if you adopted protected urea or if you switched to, to clover um, based systems. So, you know, we had all the models at a research level, but not that could be used by a farmer, him or herself, or, or by one of our advisors. So that's what the digital platform is. And so we wanted to build that decision support tool, but we didn't want to build it in a way that we'd have to spend half a day asking farmers to fill out forums or collecting information from them. So we're building, it's, it's pretty unique in the world now. This is going to basically um, use databases to, to collect virtually all the information that we will need to, to do an inventory of, of the emissions on a farm. And then it has this decision support capability that working live with it, you can see, well, what's the impact of reducing my fertilizer um, by 20% or 30%? Um, how I do it now is the hard bit, you know, mm -hmm. by bringing in clover, but what would be the impact on my emissions are of switching to protected urea? And, and that then allows a farmer working with an advisor to create a plan for, for the, the next couple of years. And um, look, we're, it's a very, very challenging thing to develop. We're doing it at really at pace. We couldn't do that without working in partnership with ICBF and Borbia. So the three organizations are working together. Mm. Um, we think it's very important that we work, you know, with Borbia so we don't have duplicate figures going out to farms or duplicate, du duplicating what, what they might be doing through the quality assurance schemes. But this, this tool now will be the center part of our signpost advisory program, as Siobhan said. It will be the start where a farmer gets to know his or her number mm -hmm. and can make his or her plan. And then the advisory program kicks in after that to, to help them in, implement the plan. I, I think it's great to see that collaboration, uh, particularly at a farm level, where you're not seeing that duplication of effort or uh, yeah. having to re-input in. There's nothing more frustrating than having yeah. to put the same information into several different systems. So I think it's great to see that 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 uh, coherency coming through. If if we could just move to to talk about the the climate uh, virtual research centre, um, yeah. this again is quite a unique uh, effort within yeah. Chagask. Yes. So look, um, people will know Chagas has has six research locations around the country. Mm -hmm. 
and um, you know people be familiar with Moor Park or Grange or Athenry or Johnstown Castle and so on here in Oak Park where we are. And there's there's climate related research going on in all of those centres. So we felt there was a, a need and an opportunity to better coordinate that research by putting it under one umbrella, not in a physical, a new physical centre, but in a virtual centre where we're pulling together all the strands of research, making sure we're getting the, the synergies from, from different groups and the, the collaboration that's necessary. Um, and also it will allow us to collaborate externally, both with organisations here in Ireland and indeed internationally. So, so having a kind of a single structure coordinating what we're doing, we felt uh, was important, but also we obviously need to to um, accelerate the research that's going on. So we're we're putting extra resources into that centre. We're we're expanding the research program. As I said, we we need you know we don't have many years to go to 2030. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of research that needs to get done by by then. So it's really important that we we accelerate the, the pace of of the research. And what will the the nature of that research be? Will it you know in terms of the mix of short term versus long term and yeah. and and the different disciplines, because I think I saw in the, the uh, report that uh, behavioural science will, will be a part of this as well, which is an interesting yeah. Uh, development. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Look, um, I suppose it's going to be a big focus on, on mitigation, whether that's mi- mitigating nitrous oxide emissions or mitigating methane emissions, be a big focus on, on carbon sequestration um, or reducing the emissions of carbon from some of our soils or, or drain peats, um, a big focus on diversification um you know and the research we might need in relation to that and adaptation to to um to the changing climate and look across all of that behavioral science is is really important you know to understand what it is that might be barriers to to farmers adopting some technologies that to a researcher might make huge sense and be very logical but mm. maybe there's some barrier there there to them and 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 the other the, the last dimension of the the center then will be supporting government in terms of support to policy formation and you know Chagas already d- does a lot of that and uh, we need to be in a position to 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 respond very rapidly to the policy needs of of government um so look that's i suppose trying to put a coherent program around all of that and ensure that there's the maximum collaboration and synergies and speed is what the the establishment of this centre will will give us. And will farmers have the opportunity to be involved in that research programme, or how how yeah. will, will they, can they engage with that? Absolutely. Well, look, you know, we we are we have lots of channels that we communicate and our, our research out, out to farmers through the advisory service or open days or whatever. But we, we also do quite a bit of on-farm research. So mm-hmm. the, the signpost uh, farms that we mentioned earlier, there's 120 of those. They're very much involved in our soil carbon research. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to measure the soil carbon on, on those farms. Uh, so they're a very important part of that. And look, there, there's lots of other uh, things that we, we, we do on farm that will, will, um, will happen o- over the course of the next couple of years. You mentioned uh, soil carbon and, and the, the area of sequestration. There, there's a lot of discussion around that uh, in recent yeah. months and years about the uh, maybe the, that are we under or over reporting the, the amount yeah. of carbon that, that uh, our typical farms in Ireland can sequester. Yeah. What, what, what's the position on that? Yeah, so look, the position is that at the moment we're, we're, we don't have very detailed country specific information for Ireland. So we're using international default values. That's the procedure that, that you use when, when you don't have your own country specific information, as most countries don't indeed. So, so what that's saying to us is that our for approximately 400 million hectares of mineral soils are sequestering somewhere around 2 million tonnes of carbon per year. But on our drained peat soils, are emitting about 8 million tonnes. So there's a net emission from our agricultural soils of about 6 million tonnes. Now, there's huge uncertainty around those figures, and that's mm-hmm. why there's a need to generate these country-specific values. So we have a big research programme going on at the moment to do that. And um, look, you know, it's early days yet with, with the research, but hopefully we hopefully the, the positives, the sequestration, might be getting a little bit underestimated currently, mm-hmm. and maybe the, the, the emissions from our drain peats are not as, as big as we're as we're um, currently calculating, but the research remains to be done. Um, there's been an enormous effort by farmers and Chagas over the, the past 30 year, years or more to improve the efficiency at a farm level. Has this low hanging fruit been gathered already? Do you think, or you know, are we are we moving into territory now where we are actually trying to reach the the harder uh, to, to reach areas? Um, look, I would say there's still a lot of relatively low-hanging fruit. Like Ireland, you know, our 
our production system for our main enterprises, which are dairy and beef and, and indeed sheep, is pretty unique in the world. It's a grass-based system, and that actually does give you a pretty low carbon footprint to start with. Mm -hmm. So you might say we're already a fairly low carbon footprint country that leaves us less room to, to improve. But even but within that system, you know, by the, the, the reduction of chemical fertilizers through either clover or um, switching then what we do continue to use to protect the urea, by rearing our animals more efficiently and, and getting to their target slaughter weights at, at a younger age, like that still is, is pretty low hanging fruit that we can go after, you know, and, uh, you know, they're generally win wins for mm. farmers. So, mm. so I think there's still a lot of um, scope for us to, mm. to take emissions out of our system mm. uh, before we get to maybe some of the more difficult technologies like feed additives or in particular a feed additive that, that will work all year round in a grazing situation. That is a, a difficult research challenge. There's also difficult research challenges around breeding animals that are specifically low methane emitters, but there's research under underway on that. So, so there's there's a combination of low hanging fruit or stuff that we can get at now, mm -hmm. um, stuff that's coming fairly soon, and stuff that is going to take a, a lot of research before we're ready to mm -hmm. to um, start taking it out to, to farms. So beyond the the efficiencies and the technologies, what other uh, routes are being explored uh, mm. for, for farmers to, to, to try and reduce their, their overall emissions yeah. from their farms. Okay. So and, look, and I suppose at the same time, increasing the value of, of the output yeah, uh, from, the, yeah. from their, their yeah, farm, look, it's, whatever it's, activities they are. Yeah. So look, and it's very important to, to remember that, that, you know, farming is an economic activity. The purpose of it is, is to produce food. Ireland is an important country uh, in relation to food production. We're small, but we still make a, a significant contribution to global food supply. And we don't want to, to damage that food production uh, capacity wh while we uh, find ways to reduce our emissions. So in terms of um, sort of other things that we're doing, other than I've just outlined, actually, one thing that's quite important is to, to continually improve the calculations we, we have or the way we calculate our emissions and agricultural emissions are harder to calculate than energy emissions and we're constantly finding ways to improve the calculation method so we have a couple of important pieces of of research that are coming to fruition in relation to the amount of methane that our grazing animals are, are producing we've we've some new information on that that is 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 um is, is very encouraging looking it's currently going through the the peer review process uh, we've also um, a better way of calculating the lifetime emissions of our beef cattle. Uh, that's a more accurate, that's kind of taken advantage of the, the very good database we have in this country on our animals. So that's hopefully going to feed into our, our calculations as well over, over the next year or two. So, so that's, that's one, one additional strand of work that we have going that's very important. But another very important strand of work that we're supporting is diversification. And, you know, the government have have um, through various schemes or through the common agriculture policy, they've created opportunities in relation to organic farming. And we put a lot more resources uh, into supporting farmers on, on, on that journey or are already in organic farming. There's a new forestry program that's currently um, uh, being processed in, in Brussels in relation to state aid approval. And, you know, I think that's going to be attractive to, to a lot of farmers. Um, certainly there's a lot of inquiries in relation to it. So, you know, that's another, I suppose, diversification option available to farmers. There's um, a, a, a big ambition in relation to our energy supply in this country to increase the amount coming from indigenous resources. And, and one of those is, is, um, is gas from, from, bio, from anaerobic digestion. Mm -hmm. So again, that's going to be an opportunity for farmers uh, to grow feedstock for, for that, or indeed to, to, to transfer their slurries into an anaerobic digestion uh, system and get back the, the residual uh, manures, which still contain most of the nutrients, uh, by the way. So, so we will see those diversification opportunities also emerging. And, um, you know, we'll certainly support f farmers that wish to engage in, in those. Because it, I suppose it speaks to that just transition uh, to, you know, where where nobody gets left behind in this transition to a, a low carbon economy. Um, another dimension to diversification, and it links to a question that has come in from our audience here, is around forestry. And it's the role it has to play in, in climate action. And uh, the question is, can, can Chagas, what can Chagas do to, I suppose, support the sector uh, more and, and maybe to, to uh, 
uh, inform the narrative around agri of yeah. forestry because I mean there is a, a negative connotations around uh, afforestation yeah. uh, as well so um, yeah. is there work that we can do there? So look the government have a very ambitious new forest uh, strategy and there's a new vision for forestry in Ireland and and as I mentioned there's a, a new program a new five-year program with I think 1.3 billion uh, in investment in, in that, that that's going to kick off fairly fairly soon. So look, um, what can Chagas do? Well, you know, we're we're looking at that new forest strategy and its ambition, and have we got sufficient resources for for that? And and look, we're we're talking to to the the department in relation to that. Do we need to put more resources into that? That's that's certainly one thing we have to to think about. I think one of the the things that I like about the new forestry program is the the support for smaller areas of forestry. Now, I know from a commercial perspective that mightn't be the ideal, but I think what it is going to do is draw a lot more farmers into forestry, maybe to plant that two hectares or, or whatever it is that is not much use uh, for commercial farming activity, but you know they might see it as a potential investment for the future. So, and I think that kind of, kind of um, spreading out of forestry rather than concentrating it in, in particular locations or particular parts of the country will be a very um, good and healthy development uh, for the, the acceptance of forestry by, by rural communities. So, you know, we will give farmers whatever support uh, they can in terms of assessing the options um, for, of, of forestry on their particular farms and supporting them through the, the process of, of establishing forestry and, and managing it for the future uh, if they decide to go, go down that route. We also, you know, want to up our research in relation to, to forestry, uh, in particular, maybe, you know, it's, its impact on carbon sequestration. It, it's not an area we're, we're strong on, so we see a gap there. And, um, you know, we all know what has happened with, with ash over the last uh, couple of years. And um, I suppose, again, you know, the, the pests and diseases of forestry is an area that uh, there's not huge strength in the organization in. So it's something we, we would like to be able to to address. So certainly is, is, is very much on our sights as to what we can do um, in relation to, to forestry. OK, we have a question in from our audience. So do please keep your, your questions coming through to us. Um, a question around um, livestock uh, emissions. Uh, what is the time scale for the adoption of the new information on emissions calculations in livestock post peer review by the EPA? Uh, in what time scale can this realistically make a difference in your view? OK, a good question. So, so look, um, in relation to the Irish inventory, the EPA are responsible for that. So, but they are always looking to see is there new and emerging science. OK, uh, apologies for that break in transmission. Um, we will keep going with our interview this morning and uh, do keep your questions coming through to us. So thanks for, for staying with us. Um, just to finish out that last question, yep. uh, Frank, in relation to the timelines. So for... I, I would say one to two years. Of course, now it's not a panacea, you know, making a more accurate inventory isn't this, it doesn't bring about a reduction in, in your emissions um, because the baseline is recalculated as well. But at least you would be working off a smaller baseline. So 25% of a smaller number uh, is a smaller number. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, in relation to renewables, um, and a question coming through here, in light of the most recent IPCC report, does Chagas see an emerging role for itself to advise landowners to adopt and invest in renewable energy as a source of income for farmers, as Denmark has done? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, so look, we, I, I, I think we, we do. Um, we are very aware of we'll say the benefits of rooftop solar and now that the changes that have been brought in in terms of availability of TAMS grants and um, and that uh, it's it's actually quite an attractive proposition I think for for um for many farmers especially if they have a good energy use in in on their own farms so in particular dairy farmers and, and pig farmers mm -hmm. so so that's something we're, we're very conscious of and we've got tools to allow farmers calculate for themselves what the payback period would be um, in terms of, of other renewables, look, anaerobic digestion, I think, is an industry that's going to get going. So mm -hmm. that's one, again, where we're, we're actually building a, um, a, a pilot scale anaerobic digester in, in Grange that should be open uh, shortly or, or in, in operation shortly, we hope. And um, so we, we, will, we are and will be in a position to advise farmers on, on the options. So do you see that uh, as part of the role of these new signpost advisors that are, are going to be hitting the ground shortly? Uh, 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 absolutely. And look, I suppose just in relation to, to the signpost advisors, I think it's very important that we, we do have a cohort of people who's, you know, this is their, their focus. But that's not to say that all our other 250 advisors that, that service our 40,000 odd clients 
uh, won't also be very uh, involved in terms of um, supporting farmers on, on this journey and advising them about the, the technology. So this is, is very much a whole of organization response. Question around the digital platform and that, you know, it's commentary here that it looks like a great tool to make a plan, but how, how will uh, we monitor the progress, uh, yeah. which is probably the, the essence of what? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, does the, because we have a great reputation in this country for, for making plans, yeah. uh, but the implementation and monitoring and executional plans is, is going to be really yeah. crucial, yeah. particularly in this instance. So the, the tool will allow uh, every year the farmer or the advisor to actually see what happened in the preceding year. So once you come to the end of the year mm -hmm. and all the information is in about, you know, the, the number of animals on the farm, which will be captured in the ICBF database, their productivity, which again will be captured through through the, the database and fertilizer use, we'll be able to run the emissions profile for, for the farm for, for that year and see uh, what progress was made in comparison to the previous year. So that, that will be part of the program is to track the progress each year of the three years that we'll be uh, enrolling farmers into the program. Okay. Um, the question in relation to the, um, the, the need to, to reduce the, the slaughter age of, of animals and uh, that a farmer, will, will a farmer not just simply replace those animals on his or her farm immediately with no net benefit for reducing emissions? So maybe yeah, it's, it's, a, really, it's a technical yeah. one of sorts, but uh, you yeah. could try and explain that it's, to it's us. A, it is a really good question. And I guess if there was an unlimited supply of, um, of cattle to go onto farms, that could be, be the outcome. But, you know, we, we have a fixed number of calves born every year in the country are relatively fixed. It's, you know, it depends on the number of, of breeding cows, dairy cows and beef cows. So that's not going to change just because farmers that are rearing and finishing cattle are finishing them a little bit earlier. You know, that's that's a, a separate cohort of farmers making their decision as to the size of their herd. So so I think what it will mean is, you know, it will allow really the way we see it, it will allow farmers maybe to, to save on some expensive inputs and maybe not need as much silage or, or whatever on their farm and, and be able to, to, to run their farm more, more efficiently. Um, uh, okay, so it needs to be looked at a, at a kind of a national, national level, level exactly, really, rather. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a question in relation to, to biogenic uh, methane here um, and the, the work that has been done by Professor Miles Allens uh, in, in the whole er this whole area. Um, should uh, methane produced by uh, animals not be classed, uh, or why, why should it not be classed as a greenhouse gas or why is it classed as yeah, a greenhouse yeah. gas, maybe is the question. Okay, so look, um, the work of Miles Allen and, and others in relation to how methane should be um, assessed is, is very important and look we're we're very aware of that and you know the look without going into the detail but basically n n nobody can can uh, methane is a greenhouse gas it does trap uh, heat in, in the atmosphere and if the concentrations of it are increasing it's trapping more heat but if the concentrations are stable which uh, can be the, the thing because it degrades fairly fast in the atmosphere unlike CO2, well, then it's not causing any additional warming. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a very important um, concept uh, in terms of how we will assess agricultural methane in the future. The issue for why we're maybe not doing that now, well, Ireland doesn't set the rules as to how we, we calculate our inventory. Mm -hmm. You know, the EU really is the, the, the I suppose, authority that Ireland has to, to follow in relation to that. And indeed, our own legislation uh, requires that we, we achieve this 51% reduction using the, the, alter, the, the GWP 100 methodology. Mm. I know we're getting very mm. technical mm. now, but the person obviously is, is quite aware of all yes. this that asked yes. the question. So look, uh, to me, um, it would be really important that agricultural methane is assessed on the basis of GWP star, or we have a separate target for it um, in the post 2030 period. And that's not just in Ireland, but you know that, that will have to happen mm. at a global level. Mm. A uh, question in relation to the national tillage area and uh, have Chagask a role to support the government incentive uh, to increase the, the national tillage area? Because uh, I know there, ha there are some concerns around, yeah. uh, particularly also with solar farms being uh, erected on tillage land. Yeah. And uh, is there a risk there of compromising the, the total area? Because last year, we was it last year or the year before, we had a, a, a major, uh, I suppose, food security uh, concerns mm -hmm. and uh, there were incentives put in place to, to support the expansion right, yeah. of the tillage sector. Yeah, and, and there was a, a small increase in the area under tillage uh, last year. Um, so 
and, and the government in the Climate Action Plan have set a target for, you know, 400,000 hectares of, of tillage by 2030, which would be an increase of about 50 percent. But what we're seeing happening this year is, you know, probably probably going in the opposite direction because we see a lot of demand for land by dairy farmers in particular because of changes in the water regulations. And that is competing with land that tillage farmers might have used in the past or might be interested in using. So, so look, in, I think this is going to require a policy um, response. I, I see the minister the other, uh, the other day has announced the formation of a, a food vision tillage group, which okay. will look at how uh, the sector can evolve and reach that target of 400,000 hectares. And we'll be very keen to be involved in that and to support the work of that group and the subsequent work then in terms of rolling out whatever initiatives might be put in place to to help the sector achieve that that target. Mm -hmm. Um, a question in relation to uh, a meat summit that uh, Chagask uh, was involved in uh, last year. Um, and the question here is why was a state agency involved in such a conference on meat? Yeah, OK, well, I could ask why not. Um, uh, so we, 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 are, we, were host, we hosted an international conference on the role of meat um, in, in society. And um, the, the purpose of the conference really was, you know, you can distill it down to say it was about well, what is the science saying about meat, not just in terms of the one dimension of what are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with meat production, but what's the role of what has been the role of meat in our evolution? What's the role of meat in nutrition? What's the role of meat in relation to biodiversity and, and soil health? What's its role in relation to uh, economics and, and livelihoods? What's its role in relation to our culture? And what's its role in relation to environmental challenges, including greenhouse gas emissions? So, you know, we had experts that spoke on, on all those themes. The, the, the papers will be, be published um, in a special issue of Animal Frontiers at the end of April or early May. And it was trying to draw together the science around meat, because very often people just think about greenhouse gas emissions when they look at our, our cattle herd or our, our, our meat production. And, you know, what we're saying is when you're evaluating the role of meat, look at the science, see what the science says in relation to the, the many uh, areas of which meat is, is important. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, is there any financial impact studies uh, uh, being done on the impacts at farm level for engaging in climate plan requirements? Yeah, well, look, at the, at the farm level, all the technologies that we would be advising farmers to, to implement um, would be cost neutral or, or cost beneficial, as, as I mentioned earlier. In relation to the, the kind of overall impact on the sector, let's say, you know, we were asked to, to model, you know, what would be the impact of a, a 20 or 30 percent reduction in the in, in the, the output or the, the cattle herd. Yeah, we're, we're, we can do that and, and have in the past done that sort of scenario modeling um, for both the Climate Change Advisory Council and indeed the Department of Agriculture. And, you know, they are it comes out as big sums, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions uh, in terms of lost revenue, both at farm level and the, 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 the knock on impact on on the other the supply sectors into the in, into farming and the, the processing sector and the, the food, uh, the food businesses that that rely on the, the food being produced. Um, we're going to go on a slightly different tangent here around education and uh, forestry and, and why is, is it not part of the green cert as a as an enterprise, um, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but um... yeah. So look, I, I mentioned earlier um, that we are, you know, we're looking at the government's new strategy in relation to to forestry, and one of the the significant elements of that is that the need for training, both at you know from from operative level right through to to, to graduate level, and Chagas has has a role to play in in training, mm -hmm. and um, we're looking at how we could best organise ourselves and what resources would we need to be able to to effectively meet uh, the training needs um, of, of, of the sector, what our role might be. And I understand there's a, a new strategy being developed for the education programmes in Chagask as well? There is, yeah. So we, we have that education, a look at our, our education service, but, you know, we're separately, are, and the two will come together, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, what, what would be our role in relation to forestry education and training? And uh, I, I think Chagas has an important role to play in that. Okay. Yeah, lots of lots of interest in forestry here in the questions this morning. Um, in terms of uh, diversification, can Professor O'Mara comment on the potential of hemp as a crop in its own right, as a carbon sequestration crop, and as an indigenous source of animal feed? Right. Well, look, I am far from a hemp expert. Um, so, 
Uh, look, it is a, a crop that there is an interest here in Ireland. There, there are um, there are a number of growers, and uh, we um, provide some information in relation to that. Uh, I know there are, there are technical difficulties in relation to to the growing and and of hemp and um, of the harvesting and use of the products of hemp again because of its relationship with uh, prohibited substances. I'm not that familiar with all of that, but you know th- that is a challenge for for um, for the industry. Uh, it is a crop that that sequesters some some carbon, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but it is, you know, it is a, a niche crop certainly at the moment. So it's it's not um, it's not in, in the immediate future. I think going to to um, you know be be a major crop, but it's certainly one that we're interested in in seeing how it might develop and uh, what policy support might be put in place to to help the development of of that. A question here around um, the amount of food that we produce here in Ireland, and we, we know that we export about 90% of our meat and our milk, and, and why is Ireland uh, uh, committed to producing uh, these, these, these large amounts of food, given the potential environmental impact that it can have? Okay, look, a really good question, and uh, one that people are, you often hear people discussing that or debating that. Look. We're, we're good at producing milk and beef off grass. That's our competitive advantage here as an agricultural country. We're not good at producing many other foods like oranges or bananas and our coffee. Uh, and we import those from countries that are good at producing them. Mm. And we export what we're good at producing to, to th- those other countries. And that's the way the world's food system is, is organized. Uh, and, and it's a good way to organize it that you produce things uh, in the regions where they are most efficiently produced. And um, uh, that that leads to actually, you know, uh, the more we can optimize that, the more we will reduce global emissions from the food system. Mm-hmm. Having said all that, obviously, each country then is responsible for its own greenhouse gas emissions. So, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't give us a get out of get jail card in relation to, you know, produce as much food and never mind the, the emissions. You know, we, we still have to uh, meet our national targets for, for greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the challenge we and the, the, the whole agri-food sector has is to be able to maintain that, that food production while at the same time uh, reducing th- those emissions. Uh, this morning we've, we've spoken pretty much solely about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, but I know that an important part of the uh, climate action uh, program, even though it's called climate action strategy, is biodiversity and uh, water quality. Can yeah. you tell us more about what the ambition is there within the, that the, the plan? Yeah. So look, I think a lot of these uh, issues they're they're very interconnected, and you know, you we we should not tackle them as as single uh, sing, single issues, and. Um, and so, so look, I think everything we, we, we will be doing in relation to creating plans for farmers will be compatible with uh, good water quality and improving biodiversity on farms. So, for instance, you know, we didn't talk much about planting hedgerows or, or we talked a little bit about forestry. Mm. You know, they're, they can be, in, when they're done right, very important contributors to improving biodiversity on farms. We talked a little bit about clover and indeed the multi-species swords, again, can be very good in relation to improving biodiversity on farms. In relation to water quality, you know, both for greenhouse gas emissions and for, for um, water quality, one of the key things is to improve the efficiency with which we use uh, fertilizers and nitrogen, improve that nitrogen cycling. So the, the two go, go hand in glove and, and what you do, what's positive for one is generally positive for the other. So, um, so we're, look, the, we're, we're, I suppose, we are very much tackling these in a holistic way, even though we're leading out and saying, you know, we need, really need to, to tackle this climate challenge through the climate action uh, strategy. Okay, we have about a minute or so left, and I want to ask you about uh, the whole area of carbon farming, if we can uh, do yeah. that in, in, as briefly as possible. Yeah. But it is something that has been discussed a lot. And you know, what role do you see farmers playing in the future markets, carbon markets. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think we are slowly uh, but surely seeing the structures emerging in relation to, um, uh, first of all, having better knowledge about what's happening carbon on farms and then uh, being in a position to to increase it or, or change it in, in a positive direction. And ultimately, I think we will see encouragement, financial encouragement or incentives or schemes uh, in place to, to uh, support farmers in doing that. This earlier or late last year, the Commission brought out you know, a, um, a discussion document around carbon farming, which really set out the parameters about how we, how would you would measure and verify it. And I think that's 
Okay, it did, it's not a carbon farming scheme, but that's a very important building block on which you would build future carbon farming schemes because you need to be able to, to measure and monitor and verify what, what has happened uh, on, on soils. And so I think we will see it, but it, it will be slow probably to uh, emerge um, as, a, as an enterprise on farms. Okay, so we'll have to watch that space. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Uh, we're just out of time now, but I, I don't know where that hour went. Mm. Um, next week, uh, we'll be joined by JJ Lenehan, who's going to be speaking about biomethane as an opportunity for Ireland. And uh, so uh, JJ will be joining us next Friday morning. Uh, I want to say special thanks to Declan McArdle for uh, supporting the production this morning. And uh, I want to wish you all a very nice weekend. And thanks for joining us this morning. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.